Appleton with an episode from the Lawfare Archive for November 11, 2022. For the past few weeks, two stories have made headlines across the country. They are, of course, Elon Musk's recent purchase of Twitter and the highly consequential 2022 midterm elections. To put it all into perspective, I thought it would be interesting to revisit a previous conversation on the internet's impact on democracy. For today's archive episode, I chose an episode from April 2020. In the episode, Evelyn Dueck and Quinta Jurassic sat down with Nate Persily, the James B. McClatchy Professor of Law at Stanford Law School, to discuss the challenges the internet may pose for democracy, the intersection of election integrity in the internet, and more. I'm Quinta Jurassic, and this is the Lawfare Podcast, April 2nd, 2020. Welcome to another episode of our Arbiters of Truth series on disinformation. This week, Evelyn Dweck and I spoke with Nate Persily, the James B. McClatchy Professor of Law at Stanford Law School. He's also a member of the Kofi Annan Commission on Democracy and Elections in the Digital Age, which recently released a report on election integrity in the internet, and for which Nate provided a framing paper. Alongside his work on internet governance, Nate is also an expert on election law and administration. We spoke to him about the commission report and the challenges the internet may pose for democracy, and to what extent the pandemic has flipped that on its head. And, of course, we discussed the 2020 presidential election. It's the Lawfare Podcast, episode 529. Nate personally asks whether democracy can survive the internet. Professor Nate Persley, you're the James B. McClatchy Professor of Law at Stanford University, uh, and you've been doing some of the leading work in recent years on governance of social media, but you weren't always a tech guy. Your background is in election law and the law of democracy, so maybe we can start by asking what got you interested in the tech field? Sure thing. Well, first, thanks for having me on this podcast. Uh, uh, It's a pleasure to be here. And Uh, I'll tell you my sort of origin story here, which is, as you said, I came into this field from the standpoint of elections. uh, And I actually moved from Columbia to Stanford to study questions of democracy. And and lo and behold, as I moved to Stanford, I became interested in tech, as as one does. Um, But there were two sort of areas of interest that converged for me. One was I'd been working a lot on issues of political advertising and had written a piece about how the future of uh, regulation of political advertising would be determined by the platforms rather than the government. And so part of this was to try to reorient the campaign finance field to start thinking about the rules that platforms had on advertising. And the second was that I, for some time, had been working on issues of political polarization And uh, the first sort of book that I published coming out when I came out to Stanford was on solutions to polarization. At the time, there was a big question that was lingering out there as to whether the Internet and new communication technologies were, uh, if not primarily responsible, at least exacerbating of underlying tendencies toward polarization, particularly in the United States. So so political advertising and polarization then sort of led me to, to start this project on democracy and the Internet at Stanford. And uh, those were, that was sort of my entry point. And then, you know, I've been trying to write a book for many years now on uh, sort of the internet and democracy. But the problem is that, um, you know, the topic keeps changing every six months. So, so, you know, eventually it'll get done if we can have some, uh, (laughs) some calm period. Yeah, I mean, I I sympathize with that a lot. As you know, um, I'm writing a dissertation on this at the moment, and the word tech lash is literally in the title of my dissertation. I'm waking up to headlines at the moment that apparently the tech lash is over. So uh, I was too slow on on getting this done. Well, but don't worry because by the time you publish it, there will be a renewed tech lash. So, so yeah, exactly. It'll be even more timely then. <laughs> so. The issue of polarization uh, f- feeds in well on that sort of lingering question of whether the internet uh, is making polarization worse or, or what the relationship is. And that leads quite well to a framing paper that you wrote about the primary challenges that the internet creates for democracy with the Kofi Annan Commission that you're working with. Maybe we can start by asking, what is the commission and what's the goal of, of the work that you're doing there? So before he died, Kofi Annan wanted to have his foundation 
uh, which had been working in the area of election integrity for some time, he wanted the foundation to uh, sponsor a commission on elections and democracy in the digital age. And so he had actually come out to Silicon Valley and I had spoken with him. And uh, this was for him what the next generation of election problems were that, that he was going to have to tackle. Um, so because he you know, had, had been dealing with election monitoring and conflict zones, not just as secretary general, but then after he had left the UN. And so um, they put together a commission of sort of technologists and former heads of state uh, that was chaired by uh, Laura Chinchilla, who's the former president of Costa Rica. The vice chair was Yves Leterme, who's former prime minister of Belgium, and several other folks uh, from civil society, as well as uh, some some academics. And the goal of this commission was to consider questions of how new communication technologies were affecting elections and, and democracy uh, writ large, but particularly to focus on the global South, because so much of the way that we think about election integrity is uh, a product of the Russian incursion in the U.S. election in 2016, as well as some analogous uh, issues that the Europeans have been dealing with. Uh, but there really hadn't been a commission that focused on the global south. And that was, of course, a, a particular concern to Secretary Annan. And so uh, we we focused on that, um, had met with a lot of uh, different groups in the developing world, uh, and then produced a report earlier this year with uh, findings and recommendations. And so you wrote a framing paper sort of assessing the primary challenges created by the Internet uh, for democracy and, and how to think about reform. So I wonder if you could tell listeners, you know, what did the framing paper argue were the, the new challenges uh, that the Internet poses for democracy? Well, I think and your, your question suggests this, which is that we, we tend to, I think, focus on the wrong things when we ask what the Internet has done to democracy, that we tend to. Uh, think about fake news or hate speech, uh, but fake news is as old as news, hate speech is as old as speech. And the framing paper tried to kind of pare away some of the the fluff in the way that we think about this question and say, well, what is it about the communication technologies themselves, particularly the internet and social media, that poses a unique challenge to democracy? And so it provides a, a set of sort of familiar points of analysis, um, starting with the speed at which information travels, the fact that it's done through viral peer-to-peer -peer transfer, the sheer amount of information that's now at our fingertips, uh, literally at our fingertips with our cell phones and how that requires some platform curation, the megaphone that the internet gives to anonymous speakers, which uh, is what I think facilitates or exacerbates the hate speech problem on the internet, as well as gives us the bot problem on the internet where we're unable to actually determine whether we're talking to a human or a machine. And then there is this the question of uh, filter bubbles and echo chambers that Evelyn uh, discussed before. And while the you know there's considerable debate as to whether the um, internet has exacerbated polarization, it certainly enables self-selecting into information ecosystems. And it's important to sort of think about how that uh, plays out. And then the final sort of two unique features are sovereignty and monopoly. The fact that the internet is, after all, the is worldwide. So it's the World Wide Web and it allows um, the proverbial, you know, guy sitting on his couch in St. Petersburg to have an effect on uh, viewers of political information in Tampa. Uh, and so, and I should say St. Petersburg, Russia and Tampa, the U.S., uh, that, that, that the sovereignty, you know, that you have the problem both of, of one country interfering in another country's elections, but also the fact that U.S. tech companies are having a role to play in elections around the world because they're setting the rules for political engagement. And then finally, it, it, this problem of monopoly, which is that the U.S. tech companies are in a sort of unprecedented position in the history of communication, uh, and specifically we're talking about Facebook and Google here, that they have uh, really unrivaled power around the world in terms of their ability to determine the rules of political engagement and communication 
far from you know their their offices here in Silicon Valley. And so each one of those features that I just described is unique to the internet. And and what is it about each one of those that then creates sort of fertile or, or, or enables uh, the kind of speech and campaign strategies and stresses that we think might be endangering to democracy. And so that's what the framing paper looked at. And then also went through the kind of classes of interventions that the platforms and governments could adopt. Yeah, so maybe before we move to those, I mean, one of the great things about the framing paper is it's kind of a bit more nuanced than a lot of the conversation that goes on around this. You know, it's neither like the internet is a boon for democracy, um, which is probably uh, an untenable view uh, anymore, but neither is it that, you know, democracy is completely doomed. And it focuses on, you know, being really more nuanced. And to pick up on that thread that you dropped of um, the polarization and looking at how filter bubbles and echo chambers work work out, I mean, some of these things are a little bit counterintuitive, or we've been surprised by some of the empirical findings around that area. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Is, is the internet polarizing us uh, as, as much as we thought? To some extent, it depends what we mean by polarization. And this is where I think the public commentary is quite slippery. So there's one school of thought that defines polarization as sort of hermetically sealed information cocoons, right? So Cass Sunstein's most most notable on this and his several books that he's written on this subject. Um, and the idea here is that you opt into a, you know, a, a social media environment or a set of websites or other technologies that then filters the information you get. And so therefore you're not exposed to outside information. Now, just on those terms, right, there... It, most people do not live in online echo chambers that are different than their offline echo chambers. Now, it is true that many people um, are going to get from their friends um, a particular sort of bias in news and information. I mean, just because our friends are not randomly selected from the population, uh, and so they're more likely to be, you know, have common interests with us. But if anything, what social media does is it allows you to maintain connections with your weak ties from your life. So um, those high school and and sort of college friends who you might not otherwise have talked to, um, except because of social media, or that crazy uncle who you otherwise only see on Thanksgiving uh, has a role to play in your social media feed. And so in some ways, you could end up with more diverse exposure to information on uh, because of friendship networks with these weak ties than you would in your own neighborhood, right? And so the question is not whether people are in online echo chambers, they certainly are to some extent, but are those echo chambers any different than what they're experiencing offline? Uh, and so are the uh, people that you interact with on social media and the sources of information qualitatively different than the ones you would get, say, from conversations in your neighborhood or in your workplace or when you turn on cable TV, right? And, you know, there's, there's good arguments to suggest that the, you're going to be exposed to more diverse sources of information online, but it's probably more of a wash that it's just like it's pretty reflective of the kind of friends you have. But but just to add a little fuel to the fire of the, of the concern about echo chambers, it is definitely the case that one of the great virtues of the Internet is also its great vice, which is that you can self-select into whether it's, you know, particularly polarizing subreddits or 4chan uh, lists or the like, that you could find a community of very far right, far left people, uh, people who are dedicated to, you know, violence and the like. You can find that more easily online, just as you can find knitting groups and, you know, uh, cancer survivor support groups and the like. And so, you know, if you were a Nazi sympathizer living in San Francisco for much of the last half century, it was very difficult for you to find common cause in your neighborhood. But now it's readily available to you if you find the websites and the chat groups and the, and the like online. And so the question I think now, at least in the empirical literature, it has moved on from, you know, whether most people live in echo chambers. I think they're, the answer is that yeah, to the extent they do, it's pretty similar to the offline lives. But what types of people live in echo chambers? What types 
are more likely to be uh, receiving this polarizing um, information. And in particular, what is it about the affordances of the platforms? For example, YouTube's recommendation algorithm uh, that might exacerbate polarization and force people toward more and more extreme sources of information. So you hinted earlier at solutions to address this problem of polarization and the other issues that we spoke about earlier. Can you tell us more about those, what you had in mind? Well, so you should think about first the variety of sources of uh, reform, which is to say that we all have a role to play. The governments have a role to play. The platforms have a role to play. And, you know, civil society, which is to say the rest of us uh, have a role to play. And if the problem is the certain types of dangerous communication, right, that occur online, there are a set of interventions that each one of those actors can adopt. Um, so they all happen to start with D. I didn't start out that way, but, but it, it allows me to memorize them. The first is that you can delete the content. And we spent a lot of time, we spent a lot of time really looking at these transparency reports and and then some of the high profile takedowns that the firms have done, whether it's anything from the Christchurch video to Alex Jones to even recently they took down some of, say, Twitter took down some of Rudy Giuliani's tweets with respect to uh, coronavirus. Now, the, the, the platforms take down millions and sometimes billions of uh, pieces of information or accounts for various community uh, standard violations. And so we should at least move off the idea that these are the public square in the traditional sense. It's very fashionable for lawyers to talk about these firms as being the new public square. But these are highly regulated speech environments uh, all of the community standards, for example, that Facebook applies would be unconstitutional under the First Amendment if they were legislated by governments. But but what we spend so much time talking about deletion and takedown, because that is in some ways the most incendiary and strong thing that they do, um, the second D is demotion. And that's really where their power lies. Uh, so that the most important thing that Facebook, Twitter, and Google do is that they decide what information comes at the top and what information comes at the bottom of either your newsfeed or the search results. And that power to organize information is one of the things that really makes them different than, you know, a government that's providing an opportunity for speakers in the public square. And so they curate information and the decisions that go into the algorithm are absolutely critical in how they uh, determine what kind of speech to promote uh, and demote. And this is also, they recognize how powerful this tool is, um, uh, but it's also what gives them, I think, greater responsibility for the speech that occurs on their platform. That it's, it's, it's not really true for them to sort of sit back and say, well, this is, you know, this dangerous speech or this, this type of content is um, problematic. Uh, but look, it's not us who's doing the speaking. It's, our users, but in reality, when they make a decision about what to put at the top and what at the bottom, they are sort of deciding which values are going to be promoted and which are going to be uh, demoted. The third D in, term, in the reform universe is disclosure, that while they can take down content or they can demote it to take it off your screen, they can also disclose uh, something about the content. And, you know, if I had to identify what it is about the online environment and particularly social media that causes the greatest challenges, it's the fact that Google, Twitter, and Facebook homogenize the packaging of information uh, in ways that uh, the offline, uh, you know, information is, is not packaged. And here's what I mean by that. That if you go to a supermarket checkout line and you see a a paper there that says Hillary Clinton involved in pizza related pedophilia scandal. You say, well, hell, I know what kind of newspapers are at the checkout sign. It's automatically discounted. But in Facebook, when every inf all information is packaged the same way, where a you know New York Times article, a Breitbart article, your son's you know graduation video, and communications from your friends are all basically delivered to you in the same wrapping. Um, there's a problem in that you don't have the cues that we have in the offline world as to veracity uh, and progeny. 
And so the disclosure, I think, is really a, you know, a way of trying to give greater information to users so that they can um, identify uh, the source of some of this content. Now, Facebook knows that um, there's a lot of disclosure that doesn't work. So that when they, for example, put a big flag on top of information that uh, said it was untrue, it led to greater engagement because then people would say, oh, let me read this untrue stuff. But but disclosure is one of the things in their arsenal that they can do to, to deal with uh, speech. I just want to say that's another a great example of why it's so important to be empirical about these things, um, because it's a kind of counterintuitive finding, right, that um, adding a label might actually have a, a counterintuitive effect that it attracts more attention. And it's kind of an underlying theme that we've had in this series a little bit about the value of transparency, because it's such a obvious solution to a lot of this. It's hard to be not in favor of transparency, especially when things were starting from such a low baseline. Um, but there is sort of some skepticism about it, whether it's because of the backfire effect that you're talking about or the implied truth effect that things that aren't flagged are sort of seen by people as being more true than they are. Um, and also, you know, the idea that it places a lot of onus on the individual recipient of information to do the mental labor, I guess, of um, processing that and turning it into something useful when, you know, a lot of evidence suggests we're not really uh, as, as proactive about that when we're using social media. So I'm just curious about sort of your thoughts in general about the efficacy of, of transparency. Well, there's, you know, there's, there's transparency and then there's transparency. So, so the, the first, when it comes to content moderation, um, I actually think that most of the disclosure mechanisms that the platforms have used are either counterproductive or largely ineffective because that while it's while it's pledged as a kind of empowerment tool for users, as you said, if it requires user labor, like to find out more information about a topic, almost no one is going to do that. So, for example, the little eye icon that is uh, next to information on a Facebook post, you know, almost no one is going to look at that stuff. And even if you do, it's not clear it helps you really evaluate the uh, credibility of the speaker. And so I think that, you know, the, the, the real sort of devil's bargain here in, when it comes to content moderation is that the most authoritarian measures are the ones that work, but they are authoritarian, right? Which is to say that you take, you, you reduce the spread of the exposure, you know, either by taking it down or demoting it, that it turns out that you can sometimes combine disclosure with some of those other methods so that the more friction you add to, for example, a deep fake video where you have a, someone forwards you a video on Facebook or puts it up, it, it, what, what Facebook does now is they, they say, do you really want to click this video? And then they actually make it a little more difficult for you to find the little button where you say, yeah, I do want to, you know, see this fake video. That's an example of where you have disclosure combined with some other more authoritarian, uh, and I use that word intentionally, uh, measure to try to make it difficult for people to see the speech. And there, there are other things like that, you know, like when they delay uh, exposure so that there's, you know, in crisis situations, and you can see this with the COVID crisis also, that the um, the different platforms will uh, elevate different types of content at different speakers, right? Whether it's the WHO and the CDC. Uh, and so they will shift, they will change their algorithm so that it might not be the most recent information, but it will be the most authoritative. Uh, and so there's Krishna Bharat, former head of Google News, had an idea that in, in one way to tackle virality is to require all information that achieves a certain level of popularity to receive some kind of uh, human review. So anyway, the, the other other types of reform obviously are, are are like that, which is that you can try to distract the, the users. You can try to dilute bad content with good content. You could try to deter bad action. And then you can also, as we were saying before, empower users with greater digital literacy, both of the platforms in general and sort of thinking about how to research uh, fake news. So uh, those, those are sort of a suite of reforms at the kind of content moderation level. So one of the interesting things about the report is that it, it takes a look at these issues from the perspective of the global south. Um, which, as Evelyn said, is often sort of left out of these discussions. Um, can you talk a little bit about what's different and what's similar for countries outside the U.S. and other Western democracies in grappling with these issues? 
Sure. So there, there are sort of unique features of how the internet is working in much of the global south. I don't want to generalize like the entire global south is the same, but that, but there are certain things that, that people need to pay attention to. The first is that in some jurisdictions, these platforms are the internet. So Facebook is the, the main way that certain uh, users in African countries uh, actually gain access to the internet. And so when we talk about like, well, there's the internet and then there's Facebook, no, that in some places they actually, it's, it's really almost a total monopoly of um, the online world. Second is that more so than in, in certainly the United States, you have the move to encrypted platforms gaining a real foothold in these places so that you end up, WhatsApp is in many ways a more important platform than Facebook itself. Uh, or even Google. Uh, and so, so much of our effort has been to try to think about the Facebook and YouTube uh, platforms as agents of polarization, disinformation, and hate speech. But, you know, what, what the rise of WhatsApp and the fact that WhatsApp has so many problems on it shows is that you don't need, it doesn't even need to be a moderated platform uh, where you see these problems. So um, you've got you know, whether it's hate speech or threats or disinformation, we're seeing it on these uh, encrypted platforms as well. So one of the other things that the report really emphasizes, which I think is sort of really interesting to uh, unpack a little, is the importance of perceptions about the integrity of an, of an election and not just the actual integrity of the election. And I think that's uh, really important right now to sort of distinguish between. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Right. I think that, you know, this has been something that I have I've been really wrestling with and in as we also prepare for the election in the US, which is that, you know, when it comes to claims of fraud or claims of election dysfunction or for anything with respect to any claim with respect to the candidates, that it doesn't really, you know, the reality is maybe bad enough. Uh, but there's perception of wrongdoing, which can in the Internet age can uh, spread like wildfire and can be uh, just as damaging. And so um, thinking about how you can have people in responsible positions of authority, and this is the hard part, be able to counteract disinformation, counteract some of the problematic content that you see online is really one of the big puzzles in trying to think about how to preserve information, uh, electoral integrity in the information age. There are a set of recommendations that we have in the Kofi Annan report um, that, are, that are, again, particularly focused on the global south on thinking about how you could have um, sort of red teams that have the expertise to be able to sort of parachute into uh, uh, different democracies to help out with things like preventing foreign disinformation, dealing with bots and trolls, uh, and the like, especially uh, hate speech that might lead to violence, because a lot of these these countries don't have the the capacity to go after that. And in some of these situations, the platforms themselves are not paying a hell of a lot of attention. Uh, we just published a report through the Cyber Policy Center at Stanford, uh, the Inf Internet Observatory run by Alex Stamos, where they found a whole network of Russian disinformation sort of operations in Africa that the uh, platforms hadn't been focusing on because they were preparing for the U.S. election. And so so in the developing world, I think there's a whole lot that one can do um, to try to build up capacity to deal with some of these problems, as well as to develop some international sort of norms and standards and, and even some agreements about foreign interference in domestic elections, about the certification of voting machines, as well as other kinds of technology related to elections, and uh, certification of certain types of campaign consultants to try to prevent the growth of the kind of international Cambridge Analyticas. Can I ask you how realistic or optimistic uh, you are about the idea of an intergovernmental agreement on the what is acceptable foreign interference? Is that an aspirational recommendation? Well, that's an aspirational recommendation, but this is one of these situations where I think we, particularly in the United States, have a kind of knee-jerk reaction to this, which is like, hell, no one, nobody outside the country should be able to mess with our elections. And if you start thinking about that in an international sense, it becomes a very difficult 
idea to sort of wrap your head around. So, so we may have a problem with, you know, Russian intelligence agencies coming in and, and messing with the U.S. election or the information ecosystem. Uh, but what about RT, which is their, you know, one of the sort of state-sponsored broadcasters as well as websites? And if the RT is a problem, what about the BBC? What about uh, you know, Chinese TV, what about the Canadian broadcasting system? Are we going to say that during elections that these many ways government funded entities are not going to be able to report on what's happening in the U.S. and be have it available to U.S. viewers? Similarly, the Voice of America, right, being used in, in all across the world to try to, uh, you know, bring information, uh, particularly in places that are authoritarian Government. So I look, I'm not I don't think you're going to get a Geneva Convention on this, but I actually think that it would be good to have the conversation at the highest levels as to what even among sort of uh, the European and, and U.S. democracy about, well, what, what do we think? Are the right standards uh, between us, um, and then you could you could sort of build out from there. But I actually don't. I think this is a very difficult question to answer as to what the right rules should be for how a foreign entity uh, should be treated when it comes to the election of another. So, so the report came out before the pandemic really arrived in full force. When, you know, people were still being very critical toward tech companies, there were all these complaints that companies were, you know, not moderating enough. And now um, there's a sort of surge of goodwill toward these companies that, you know, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube have been really aggressive in stamping down on misinformation, removing tweets. Does this paradigm shift sort of change Anything that you have in the report, or would you do anything differently if you wrote it in a in a world that was already familiar with COVID nineteen? Well, I think one of the interesting questions about the COVID nineteen and the platform's response to it is whether the more extreme measures that they've taken with respect to the pandemic are ones that they would take more broadly. So you're right that I think they're getting some goodwill by a lot of the uh, decisions that they've made, whether it's giving free advertisements to the WHO and the CDC or taking very aggressive tax against uh, COVID related disinformation. But there's a sense in which this, you know, if they show that they're really good at doing this, that there's going to be even greater pressure for them to adopt these measures as routine when dealing with, say, election disinformation and the like. And so they've been quite aggressive on on disinformation with respect to the virus and taking down whether it's false medical cures or all kinds of other false content. And we've seen that they're filtering when they put it, when they have some automated filtering that that does the work, that it uh, actually sweeps in a lot more speech than that, than they wanted to. Uh, and Evelyn's written a, quite a bit about this, I think, uh, actually on the Lawfare page, about uh, how they are basically using the tools that they've always had at their disposal, but then deploying them with some greater sort of aggression now. So I don't think the tech lash is over, so Evelyn can rest secure that her, her dissertation title is going to make sense uh, uh, over the next year. And look, it's, all it's going to take is is one more election where people blame social media for the result, and you'll see um, that they will you know, continue to blame it. But they, they have, I think, bought themselves some, some goodwill here to show the upside potential of technology. Though I think people are still, you know, concerned about uh, disinformation, and and so, as aggressive as they've been on the disinformation front, I think that it is a double-edged sword because uh, it may show what they are capable of doing, and then greater demands for them to do that in the normal course of things. Yeah, absolutely. You're already seeing people asking the question: Hold on, if you can do this in the context of. Uh, pandemic misinformation why can't you do it in the context of political misinformation and um while the election is sort of on hiatus at the moment i i suspect uh, it's going to come back with a vengeance one of the things that we've talked a lot about today so far in the conversation is the importance of responses being really empirically informed and, and based in uh data and that brings us to another uh really sort of exciting and interesting initiative that you're involved in, uh, which is Social Science One. So maybe you could describe for our listeners what Social Science One is. Sure. So the the idea behind Social Science One is to provide some way for academics who are researching social media and democracy 
to have access to the data of the firms that control most of the information on the impact of social media on democracy. And so Facebook is our sort of first client in this. And I shouldn't say client, but our first partner in this. And there's a long sort of story that we've written about and people can see at socialscience.one uh, how this idea got off the ground. But in the wake of the Cambridge Analytica scandal, there was a real risk that Facebook and certainly other companies would shut off all academic access to the platform. Fortunately, Gary King, my, my co-conspirator in, in this, um, had had a discussion with Mark Zuckerberg about academic access right around the time of Cambridge Analytica. And um, Zuckerberg decided that it was worth it to try and figure out some other way to provide safe, secure, privacy-protected access to Facebook data. And so that was two years ago when this promise was made. And it has turned, it has been a real slog to try to figure out a way to get data outside of Facebook into the hands of the world's scientific community. It really took us over a year and a half um, to fulfill the promises that Facebook made to the academic community. And even then, um, because of the problems with privacy uh, and Facebook data, what they've provided us is woefully insufficient, but it is still one of the largest social science data sets ever produced. It's 38 million URLs over a two year period um, with all kinds of data attached to them as to the categories of people who may have seen or interacted with those URLs, as well as information as to whether it was tagged as hate speech or disinformation and the like. And so in addition to providing that large data set, it's not, it's not a clean data set. In order to protect privacy, they deliberately put in a lot of noise through principles of what's known as differential privacy. And so it's not an easy data set to, to uh, analyze. It's got several trillion numbers in it, but it's, uh, it's a start. And our hope is that if we can start building some uh, confidence in both the data that they're providing and in this relationship that we can move on to other data sets. But, but I've at least become of the view that we really need government intervention to open up the platforms here, that the platforms can't keep crying GDPR and other kinds of privacy rules to prevent researchers from getting access to the data. Because that's when, been what I've been living for the last two years in this Facebook project is that whenever we ask for something, they say that, well, that would be a privacy danger. So, you know, we, we've started, research has started on this. There will be some papers coming out in the next few months off of this new data set, but we really need to do more. Yeah, so there's there's so much there, I think, on on every level, the story of both the data in the first place, and then the story of, of how you got the data, which we absolutely want to dig into. But just to set the scene a little, is there a way you could sort of describe what the data will enable? Like you, you have all this information, what, what can it tell you? Like, what kind of research will you be able to do now that you couldn't do before? So if you wanted to get a sense of the relative prevalence of, say, sharing of certain types of URLs, like ones that have been fact-checked and, and proven to be or shown to be uh, lies, right? You can now ha you can do some of those studies to look at the relative prevalence of disinformation as opposed to other kinds of URLs. The same is true with hate speech. If you want to get a better sense of how hate speech is uh, popular and engaging uh, on the internet. So in addition to, you know, the links and information about the links, like such as whether fact-checked or hate speech, we also have the popularity and, 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 and some data uh, about those links, about who was exposed and interacted with them. Um, we broke it down by gender, for example. We break it down by region, or, you know, basically country. We also break it down by... Um, age into age buckets, right? To see whether, you know, one of the big questions has always been, are old people more likely to engage and forward false information? And we can, we can look at that now with this. You can also just do some basic analysis of the popularity of different types of URLs in different countries. 
And so, and in the U.S., we actually have a, a measure for what's known as political affinity, which is basically an ideological measure. So you can get a sense of the types of URLs that conservatives and liberals are interacting with and seeing. So, so there's a lot, there's a lot there, but I want to caution and manage expectations here that while the data set, the raw data set has a, a lot of information because of the noise that Facebook has added to protect privacy, it does obscure a lot of the results. And so that's where we really don't quite know yet how robust the results are going to be uh, as to whether the, the relationships that we see in this noisy data would hold for the, uh, the raw data. And that's what we've got we've to further push them on. One of my favorite quotes from you is in the protocol in, in February this year after securing the release of that first major data set. And you said, you said to them, I'm happy to be quoted saying this. This is the most frustrating thing I've been involved in in my life. Um, <laughs> so, and you were sort of saying then that you've given up in a, in a, in a, in a small way and sort of think that government regulation is the answer. So are you still hopeful about the sort of private academic relationship um, and, you know, expanding social Social science one and looking and approaching other platforms or are you sort of giving up on the model completely and just are we waiting for some um, regulator to crack these uh, platforms open no i mean and, and I'll, I'll i'll sort of announce here that we are doing more with facebook so for example we're trying to develop a survey platform where some of the major academic surveys can then be integrated with facebook data based on user consent so that then we could have good survey data, like the, some, like the ANES, the American National Election Survey. It would be great to get Facebook data integrated with that, and that's something that we've been working with as well as with some other surveys. So, so I don't want to, I, I don't want to be too self-deprecating here uh, as to what you know the the and overly cautious in the way I describe the data. But we are moving forward, and there are certain things like the CrowdTangle API, which is a a, prod, a company that Facebook bought, but which looks at all kinds of public posts, that the CrowdTangle API is something that we've made uh, available through Social Science One as well, as well as some additional um, features with the ads library API. So uh, yeah, I, I think that we are building on this and it's going to, what we have in a few years will be better than what we have now. But if we really want to figure out who is seeing what when online, we are going to need some kind of exception that's granted by governments because um, GDPR does scare the hell out of the lawyers in these companies. And same with the FTC consent decree uh, in the US as well as the California uh, privacy law. And so we need to have clear carve outs for research and uh, this is not because we should trust researchers to do the right thing. You need to make sure that there are ways of punishing researchers and surveilling them as they try to do their research on any data that is privacy sensitive. But I think the Europeans are going to be the ones that that help us here, uh, that I think that uh, in the next year that you should see some legislative action at the com commission level that will uh, try to deal with this problem of academic access to private data. Yeah, so can you say more about that? What what are you expecting to come out of Europe? Well, I've gone to Brussels probably three times in the last year uh, because I have greater hope that they will do something that, rather than, say, the U.S. And the the basic format of any either safe harbor for research or mandated access for research would have the following components that you would have some government or some third party vetting of the researchers, which is something that we at you know, Social Science One were, were doing. You would then have uh, vetted research facilities, whether they're at the firms themselves or at say academic or government institutions. You would have data that is placed in a kind of academic sandbox, which could be uh, examined in that environment. You would have, and I was serious when I said surveillance of the researchers as they do their work, everything that they, they put into the computer as well as videotaping, making sure that the right people are analyzing the data should be done at the same time. Then there should be a vetting of the results before they're made public to make sure there's no leakage of privacy and then they can uh, publish their results. But as a result of all of taking all of those measures that then there would not be any liability for the companies under 
uh, GDPR or other privacy protections. And so that needs to be the deal that gets made is that if you if you amp up on the security side and make sure that researchers do not turn themselves into another Cambridge Analytica, that then um, the platforms won't be liable. And I have to say, you know, while the platforms have a kind of uh, uneasy relationship with academic researchers, you know, these I like to say that Facebook is a they, not an it. Right. There are people who are I mean, Facebook would have one of the best data science departments of any university in the world. Right. If it were its own university and you have people inside the firms who are really lobbying to get more research done and get more research out there. And then, of course, there's the business and lawyer types at these firms who are you know, wondering why the hell they should take on any of this risk because it's, you know, it never, both legal risk is if they were to get sued for privacy violations, but also reputational risk if they were to find, if the researchers were to find something bad. And so I think that, um, you know, there's a chance that the, the Europeans will, you know, and my estimation of this, that they are uh, thinking in the new, I can't remember what the title of the law, the new data something act that they're contemplating now for the next six months, that there will be something about research that's there. But I'm I'm sort of trying to urge them to be as aggressive as possible with this uh, to because I think they're going to get just one shot at it to try and uh, get these firms to open up. That's fascinating. And it'll be really interesting to see what comes out of that. So having hopped across the ocean to Europe, I do want to pivot back to the United States and back to uh, the other aspect of your work on this on election law, it seems sort of silly of us to to have you on and not discuss the 2020 election. So I wanted to ask, what you know, what concerns you about the 2020 election right now? There, there's a lot going on. There's disinformation, physical voting in terms of COVID. You wrote a great piece about this recently for Lawfare, or something else entirely. Well, you know, it's funny. I, you know, this is in some ways. Let me let me put sort of Nate personally on the couch for you for a second here, which is to say that. You know, if you every six months or so, I think I know what I'm going to be doing for the next year, what I'll be writing about, what I'll be researching. And then something comes along and completely changes it. Sometimes it's a redistricting controversy. Sometimes it's, uh, you know, something that's happening at Facebook or something that's happening in the electoral system. Or in this case, it's the fact that we have a pandemic which threatens the integrity of the elections. And so that is, I have completely sort of thrown myself into the really nitty gritty questions of how to prepare for the election during a pandemic. Let me just as a bridge to that, let me just talk about the issues of misinformation uh, related to the election, because uh, we talked about misinformation and disinformation with respect to the um, pandemic. Um, I think, you know, we still have to be concerned about that uh, when it comes to this election. Um, I think that what you're finding is that while we spent so much time worried about Russian disinformation efforts uh, after the 2016 election, that it's becoming extremely difficult to distinguish between foreign sources of disinformation and domestic sources because they are mimicking each other and actually just parroting, uh, you know, uh, stuff that's in domestic content. And so to some extent, I think the focus on Russian disinformation tactics in 2016 has, has given them more credibility, more designation as a, as a superpower when in reality, you know, it's not clear how much the Russian sponsored disinformation had a big effect, but Having said that, that doesn't mean the online environment is a particularly healthy one for this election. Um, uh, there are really almost no rules that that the campaigns I, and the interest groups on the outside are going to be abiding by when it comes to you know lies and and polarization uh, and the like. And so then there's increasing pressure on the platforms to be more aggressive, whether it's on things like deep fakes or on um, political advertising that's misleading. Uh, and the like. And so I focused a lot on that. Um, but right now, I do feel like all of those issues are so extraneous to the basic question as to whether we can run the election safely without endangering any voters. And right now, we've had several primaries that have been postponed months for COVID-related problems. And so the question is, well, what's going to happen in the general and let me just let me just make a prediction here um, uh, so that you can call me on it in a few months, which is that 
we're going to be sort of fretting about this for the next two months when we when we're in the heat of the pandemic, and we're going to be thinking about all right, how should we be moving all voters to mail? Should we be um, making you know washing down polling places and making sure you know you've got polling poll workers in hazmat suits and the like? And then sometime over the summer, when the the pandemic seems to subside, we're going to forget about this. We're going to say, well, we we've missed the worst of it, and that in some ways is the thing that concerns me the most is that. We're going to kind of let our guard down. And then when the pandemic comes back in the winter, as it, it promises to do from a lot of the modeling, then uh, it could be happening right in the first week of November. And we're going to deal with this crisis again. And so right now I'm trying to work with local officials and other sort of associations of election officials on thinking about how to prepare for voting during a pandemic. A lot of this is is about trying to get the necessary resources to the local jurisdictions with respect to um, moving to vote by mail. Some of the logistical problems are really uh, huge. And then how do you retrofit polling places so that you can have uh, safe voting in November? No shortage of things to be worried about, it seems. So just to close out then, in, in 2017, you wrote a journal article that was provocatively labeled or titled, uh, Can Democracy Survive the Internet? And, you know, actually, I was going to ask you, you know, can it as a final question, but with all of us locked inside at the moment, um, and the sort of internet being the only form of communication that a lot of us have, um, maybe a better question is, can democracy survive without the internet? Um, <laughs> what, 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 feel free to answer either of those questions. <laughs> That's, well, that, you know, well, the, the answer for both of those questions is like the answer may surprise you, which is a typical sort of Internet kind of answer. Right. Uh, yeah. So that, you know, look, the Internet is a tool for good or ill. It can be used by bad actors as well as good actors. We are now, as we've been discussing, in a period where we're seeing the absolute necessity of the Internet and the platforms that are often reviled uh, when it comes to providing information that's uh, relevant to the pandemic. I think, you know, my, my the answer to the question as to whether democracy can survive the Internet is that, yes, it can, but it needs to adapt. And in particular, we need to think about the role of these multinational corporations that are controlling the speech environment and how we can have outside uh, sources of accountability to try to provide sort of greater democratic uh, accountability for uh, these private corporations. Because one of the things that the Internet really has done is that it has destroyed a lot of the intermediary institutions that had channeled uh, politics in places like the United States and elsewhere, whether it's political parties, the legacy media, and the like. And so in their stead or in their place, we've had these private companies become the primary mediating institutions for politics. And that's a problem uh, because their incentives are not necessarily aligned with what would be called democratic incentives. And so we need to figure out new types of institutions to try to rein them in. The experiment with this Facebook oversight board that I know, Evelyn, you've written quite about a lot about uh, is, is a first step in the right direction. Um, and we need to see as kind of flourishing of these other kinds of institutions to try to uh, make sure we have democratic accountability for the big internet platforms. All right. Well, let's leave it there. Nate, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. You've been listening to The Arbiters of Truth, the Lawfare Podcast's miniseries on disinformation. You can find past episodes in the Lawfare Podcast feed, and we'll be back for another episode next Thursday. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. Thanks this week to Nate Persily. Our music is performed by Sophia Yan. Our audio engineer is Jacob Schultz, and our producer is Jen Pache Howell. Please rate and review the Lawfare Podcast and whatever app you use, and thanks for listening.